you know, the kind of pockets of habitat that the adults prefer. Uh, the, the habitat preference really boils down to the larvae, from what I've been able to see, where there's actually a key difference. Of course, one excludes the other for the most part. So, um, why should you be listening to me, of all people? Uh, it's because I've spent an un unhealthy amount of time staring at little brown butterflies. <laughs> and what, what I like to say is after, after the first hundred hours, it starts to get easy. Um, so, <laughs> there, no, one, no one else was insane enough to take on this challenge, and I didn't realize it was going to be this hard when I got into it, but here I am now. Um, so, um, I've spent eight years so far studying this. I started in 2016. Um, Back when I just uploaded a photo of a Carolina Seder onto this e butterfly somewhere, and of course, Dennis Forsyth he emailed me and said, You can't tell that apart from this other species. And I went, What's an intricate Seder? And then down the rabbit hole I went. Um, and so back in 2018, uh, I published a paper in the Journal of the Lepidopter Society um, detailing um, what I had been able to. to figure out between the two species in coastal South Carolina between 2016 and 2018. And from there, uh, just kind of been building and refining upon that data set since. Um, there, there's several factors that we can use to differentiate, differentiate these butterflies. Um, and I can just go over the um, <laughs> um, they're, they're each, um, more concrete than the last. Some some are just kind of, they help you, they're, they're tiebreakers or they help point the probability in one direction or the other, and then there's others that are just concrete, absolute. Um, and we have morphology, ecology, behavior, local phenology, and of course, an unholy amount of practice is needed in order to apply any of those in the field. So, um, the genitalia are the only concrete method to differentiate the two species 100% of the time for 100% of individuals. So, but this required, this is not really a field expedient method, method of identification, because you gotta collect the butterfly and you have to kill it, and then you have to prepare it for dissection, and then you have to dissect the better dissect the scope, if not a microscope. Um, males are a little bit easier to do than females, but then you can kind of palpate the abdomen and expose the genitalia and examine it. With females, you actually have to die, prepare and dissect them in order to be able to tell. Um, so there, there's details in the original describing paper, uh, common version 2014, uh, if you want to know more about how to do that. Uh, but with males, the key difference to look for is the shape of the uncus. Um, and that's this thing right here. So in male intricate satyrs, the uncus has pointed to him. In male Carolina satyrs, it's flat, it's truncated. This little bump right here in the Carolina satyrs is just cut off. It's not there. Um, and additionally, the, the genitalia of the Carolina satyrs are just wider overall, uh, which is where the incompatibility comes in. So, but again, this is not field expedient. You, this have, you have to take it back to the lab, you have to do this the It's something that can be used to positively identify specimens and that kind of stuff, but for most of us, it's kind of neat to know, but it doesn't really help. Um, so, the, um, another key point to, or another key, um, Thing you need to know in order to properly do uh, concrete identification, you have to be able to sex the butterflies um, because there's differences in in the morphology that are, that are unique only to the males. So you have to be able to tell them. You know. So in males, right here, you can see they have a narrow, sort of straight abdomen. It's finger shaped. Um, and down here on the females, it's more rounded. It's a lot wider. It's I like to say it's egg shaped. Um, and so. You really have to keep this in mind before you go to the next step, um, because if you're not able to sex the butterfly, it won't do you a lick of good when it comes to identifying it from our next thing, the dorsal surface. So this is the most reliable method for identifying between the two members of the species um, that we have, but it only applies to males. So male intricate satyrs lack any significant androconia on the dorsal, dorsal surface of the forehead. Carolina satyrs have a distinct patch at the base of the dorsal surface of the forewing that shows up as one or two shades darker, especially on fresh butterflies, as well as um, when you're in your really good light. Um, so, um, I'll show you these real quick because it's better to explain this. Uh, but over here we have Carolina satyr, and over here we have an intricate satyr. And as you can see, I don't know how well this 
shows up in the contrast of the presenter, but there's a dark patch right here at the base of the doorway. In male Carolina staters, when you get into the light, in the bright light, that is just blazing obvious uh, whenever they spread their wings, which is never. But and you, if you look down here in these photos that I took underneath the second scope, you can see that there's actually a granular difference in the scales of the four wing. These are the anthracone dimensions. You see the lacking. This is taken from these two locations on these two wings. Um, so, uh, this is the best practice uh, for, uh, for uh, making state or county records on this species. I think we've got most of the state records already, already pinned down at this point. Um, but um, if you want to be absolutely 100% certain you're looking at an injured satyr, you have to be able to sex the butterfly, and then if you can determine that it's a male, then you have to coax it into opening its wings. And once you've done that, you have to get a good photo of the surface of the floor. But once you do that, you can say, beyond a shadow of a doubt, exactly what species you're looking at. But as we all know, that doesn't happen very often. Um, so that brings us to the most practical use that in quotes, the most practical means for identifying between the two species in the field. And that is for examining the post median line. Now, the post median line is the second squiggle on the hind wing um, in these, these butterflies. I'll show you right here. So this line here on the outer, the outer of the two lines on the, uh, the ventral surface of the hind wing, that is the post median line. So, this technique, once you get good enough, is about, it's accurate with 95% of individuals, which for most of what we're, we're doing is, is good enough. Again, like I said, it gets easy after you do the first thousand butterflies. Um, so it works on both males and females, um, but it, there's definitely a steep learning curve when it comes to the black in the field. Um, but you can observe this with photos, with binoculars, or with collected specimens, or specimens that you have in hand in the hand or in the jar or in the net. Uh, so you can do this without harming the butterfly, without disturbing the butterfly. Uh, this is the most practical means for identifying the um, two. It's also a lot easier um, to get a photo of the ventral surface uh, than it is to get a photo of the dorsal surface. And it's also a lot more forgiving. And if you get a weird angle on a male intricate sailor, um, or if it's, got substan if it's got substantial wear, it'll look like a scarf patch in the way. But it's, it's really, it's, Male Carolina Cedar is obvious for the fresh it's there. And the debating between the two is probably more of a part of the female. But. Can you go um, back to the, the picture of the comparison? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, between these two, you may be wondering what the difference is. Um, so, over here, this is Carolina Cedar. And as you can see here, um, if you look at this, the upper large eye spot, if you look directly below that, you can see that there is a line that bulges away from that eye spot. And immediately below that, it bulges back out towards the outside of the forewing, and it comes back in and does whatever it does over here. There hasn't been any, um, any consistent pattern noted below this upper half. Over here, the intricacy, conversely, it's pretty much flat and straight. From this uh, third eye spot here all the way up, there is no bulge away from this large eye spot up here. And a key note, and this is something that I have to stress a lot, is this bump right here, vein M3. There is a small bump or corner or angle that just shows up here very consistently in the sailors. Um, there is some variability down the corner we're finding out that females don't, they're not always super consistent in this feature. They have a bump, but sometimes it stretches out over an extra vein. But in the sailors, what you're looking for is a little bump or a corner right here on vein M3 straight line right above. The Carolina Satyrs like to say there is a reciprocal S-curve that goes through the vein right, or through the post median line right here. It always bulges away from this eye spot and it bulges back out around it. However, it's not perfectly consistent. Um, there is a lot of variability in these. Um, so as you can see over here, these are all the intricate satyrs. And if you try to pick some more tight ones to put in here, so I'm not going to torture you about yet. But so as you can see, bump there, straight line. Bump there, straight line. Bump, straight line, little bump, straight line. Carolina Sanders, you've got that S curve here, S curve, another one, another one. 
And that's the, the key thing to look for. Um, what helps me a lot when I'm identifying these from photographs is I tend to squint and look at them because that eliminates a lot of the, the small little perturbations in the lines. Um, because if, if you really obsess and look at it in too much detail, you, you can blur the two together, but if you squint, your eye just kind of fills in the gaps. And once you've got that pattern trained in, it makes it a lot faster and more efficient to identify. Um, additionally, uh, as an added bonus on here, there's another feature you can look at at the ventral surface of the hind wing that can help, that I like to use as a tiebreaker. This is something that was, that someone on the bug guide noted in 2017 published the finding for it in my paper. This is something that hasn't had a significant amount of, of work gone into, as far as I know, I'm the only person working with this feature on the butterflies, and that's the sinuous band gap. And so this is a, a, a this is the joint between the submarginal line and the postmedian line near the torus of the ventral surface of the high wing. And so where these two lines meet, this the space in between this void and this high spot, that is the sinuous band gap. So, this feature is even less consistent than the post median line. Um, however, there is consistency in the intricate stator, whereas conversely, there is an extreme degree of variability in the Caroline stator. So, um, you can't use this feature to identify an intricate stator from a Carolina stator, but you can use this feature in a minority of the butterflies to identify a Carolina stator away from the intricate stator. I wouldn't rely on this feature to make your full ID, but if something's gone horribly wrong here, you can't identify it from the post median line, you can look down here and you can you can make a better call. Because in Carolina stators, um, um, there's something called a, I dubbed a acute reduction of the sinuous bank cap. And as you can see over here, in the city on these Carolina stators, that gap is small, it's reduced, it's truncated, there's almost nothing there. Um, however, you do get Carolina stators that it's wide and open, but for intricate stators, it is almost always of just, it's like a deep U or sometimes a deep V. Um, and, and Carolina stators can get that. But when you just see this, just complete reduction of that gap where it's almost touching the lower eye spot, that I have not found a single individual of intricate stator that demonstrates that feature yet thus far. Yes. Do you have a slide or something that you can see these? Yes, I've got, um, I don't have the PowerPoint up, but I am recording it, so I'm going to have this up online afterwards. Uh, this is um, not, this is not, this is not, this is Uh, 
they're not perfectly consistent. Um, but what I have noticed is that Carolina staters are a lot more consistent. Uh, Intricate staters are a lot more consistent than Carolina staters. Um, I rarely ever see just wild abnormalities in these features in an intricate stator. However, I have just seen the strangest things uh, on Carolina staters. Additional eye spots for the median and post-median line meet, rather than submarginal in the post-median line meeting. There's just an additional line or circle somewhere on the wing. Um, just really wacky things seem to show up very often in Carolina staters, but I have not seen that same degree of variability. And like I said before, there's some additional weirdness going on in the peninsula of Florida populations of intricate satyrs. Um, there seems to be a higher degree of variability as well as um, intricate satyr females seem to have a slightly different type of shape to the line. Um, that, that needs some more research to bear it out. I think this was the crux of the reason why uh, uh, the earlier papers didn't weren't quite as confident with the post-median line being a reliable field mark. Is a lot of that research was done in the peninsula of Florida. So they were just seeing a higher rate of variability, so they didn't put as much stock in it. But when I started doing my own research in coastal plains of South Carolina, um, I was not seeing the same level of variability. So they're seeking, going through 4,500 photos at this point, it seems that that variability is pretty much concentrated uh, in peninsula of Florida. And I, there seems to be some additional weirdness going on in Texas. But there's not such a small sample size of the that we can't really put much thought into that. Um, so, oh, but another key point is if you just see something weird going on with it, the probability meter is pointing towards the Carolina Stater. You can't say definitively one way or another, but I would put it more towards the back pocket. Um, and again, just some more examples of timing variability. These are all Carolina Staters. Um, so you can see that you know, where these curves come in on the line is different. Here's one of those extra pseudo I spots I was talking about. You know, you've got a sinuous banding gap that you know, is fairly open on some of these, but more pointed than other ones. Um, early spring butterflies tend to have this sort of stranger plumage over here for whatever reason. The butterflies come out in February or March, particularly down the coast where I am. Um, and you just get a lot more of that in the Carolina State. So I've got a little key up here. Um, I'm not going to go into super detail on it, but this is kind of the internal procedure I run through in my head and the um, The first thing first is if, if you can see the dorsal surface, observe the dorsal, dorsal surface. If you can see the abdomen, second butterfly. If it's male, look at that, the, uh, the uh, bottom half of the dorsal surface of the doorway. You can Distinctly see it if you're not in some weird light or at some extreme angle and you can clearly make out the color pattern, go with that. Anything else is irrelevant. I don't give you a concrete idea. Um, but if it's a female or if, just, if it's not cooperative, which is close to that, um, then you're going to have to go down to the post of the line. And then at that point, you want to see whether or not it matches the type form of the, the interest here. I like to use the hand here as a demonstration. It's got a corner with the knuckles and it's straight right above it. Or with the Carolina Sayer, I can't make the shape of my hand, but it makes an S. Um, you want to try and match those two. And if you, if you just can't quite match it up between one or the other, you then want to look at the sinuous band gap. Um, and if the sinuous band gap is just extremely reduced, you're going to want to lead towards Carolina Sayer. And if it's not, and you can't, um, you can't uh, match it to either post median line type that you're just going to have to leave the butterfly at genus level, or email me and send me a copy. What percentage of each can be found in nature? Depends on where you are. <clears throat> um, it's entirely habitat dependent. Um, but um, so just real quick, um, I, there's certain habitat types and certain tidings with phenology. We will go to a site and there will be nothing but injury. Come back two weeks later, it's good. Or sometimes you go to a site and you can search and search and search, and no matter how promising it looks, you only ever find Carolina Sayers. However, I almost always see the two in the same site. Not necessarily the same micro site, the same overall site, but not necessarily at the same time of year. So there's, and again, that's another point towards um, them being distinct species, is they have separate phenology. 
they emerge at different times. They are not synced up in any capacity. Um, so I'll get into more detail on that later. Uh, but it's when you're in the right habitat, you're just as likely to find one or the other. If you get down in the right microsite, you're more than likely to just find only one. So just going to the, the next logical extreme when it comes to morphology, uh, I was able during the course of my research to get um, larvae of both species and observe them in the field. So as you can tell, they were identical. Um, who would have thought? Who would have thought? But um, the, the only difference I was able to tell between the two, and the eggs are identical as well, is that the intricate sitter have more of a lime green hue, and the Carolina satyrs have more of a bluish green hue. Again, incredibly subtle. It's even more subtle than the adult butterflies. But that was the only discernible feature I could tell. Um, and the pupae themselves are also extremely similar. However, I did note one key feature. There is an abdominal spot on Carolina satyrs that just isn't there in intricate satyrs, but I've only been able to see like two photos of either total so far. So that's an incredibly small sample size, but that's what I got. But as you can see right here, in Carolina satyrs, there's a, a dot right there. It's not there in intricate satyrs. So in the one in a billion chance you run across one of these in the field, you'll be able to tell apart. Um, I have only seen one other person report. Um, an intricate stator pupae in the entire eight years I've been studying this anywhere on the citizen science platform, and that came in like last year. Um, actually, the spring, I think. Um, and one other, and I think that same person also observed a couple of caterpillars, but I couldn't identify them as genus. Um, then there's two or three photos of Carolina stator pupae out there floating around. I'm sure there's some of the caterpillars in there. Feel guys. But this is the whole life cycle of a male intricate satyr. Um, this is the actual butterfly that it goes right here. This is just some random one I put in there. It's a um, But I don't have the uh, first in star, but we do have second, third, and fourth. Or it is terminal. The dot in Carolina satyrs, there's a dot here. But since this is an intricate satyr, there's just a dot. I never actually found a Carolina Sater Sater pupa or pupa to photograph. Um, so I feel like still in this photo. Um, so there, there are differences um, I've noted uh, in their life history uh, as well as their phenology, but as far as the actual larval life history and that kind of stuff, they appear to be extremely similar. They both use they both use grasses as larval most plants. Um, I noticed in the coastal plain a lot of use of dicambellium, and I I've noticed a trend where Chasmanthium will seek, particularly Chasmanthium laxum, uh, which is uh, slender widows, seems to directly correlate to their bee stators in the location. I, mean, I don't know if it's a habitat thing or a host plant thing, but when you find this plant in density in a forest habitat, there's always stators to find. Um, and I did observe open position on that, but I never actually saw any um, larvae on it. But I found a ton of larvae on my head. Also, just recently, I'm, I'm at this point convinced that they're using Japanese still grass, both species of those plant. Um, because it's actually, Dave and I just got Spartan County record a couple weeks ago, and we were just in a mass monoculture of Japanese still grass. There was nothing around, and it was intricate stators flying all throughout it. Um, haven't actually observed open position of larvae on it, but I'm, I'm convinced that it utilizing it. Um, but they lay eggs singly on blades of grass. The larvae feed underneath the leaf and they go edge in. Um, and uh, they tend to pupate in the immediate vicinity or on their actual host plant, uh, as far as I can tell. Um, they did the, the larvae over winter, uh, and then they pupate in late winter, and then they close in early spring, uh, at least on the coast. I know they delay further up in the winter. Yeah. I spent my whole life in sea on it, so all my stuff is kind of thin out of shape for everybody else. But I'm used to these suckers coming out in like late February. So um, I did a note one population of intricate satyrs uh, back in 2018 just skipped the whole spring group. It just came out in June, uh, which was strange because the Carolina satyrs came out. And I had seen them the prior or the spring out. So again. Anecdotal, but there seems to be something there. There seems to be that intricate satyrs are not as common in spring, from what I've seen, just from 
the citizen science reports but don't get a lot of intricate staters in spring, and then they sort of pick up in early summer, fall is really when they take off population wise. Um, that needs to be investigated more thoroughly. Uh, and additionally, like I mentioned before, the, the two species emerge asynchronously from each other. So you can be at site and you can have, you know, just one species out fresh. Two weeks later, you then have fresh Carolina staters out, you then have fresh Michigan staters out. Um, and so that can it can cause a lot of turmoil when you're trying to identify things. If you show up at a site and you're, you're only seeing one thing and you don't know whether or not you know what you're doing, or if there's actually just one thing there, and then you show up a week later, and there's just as many problems. Um, that's why you take pictures. That's why you take pictures. And then you email. Um, so uh, the big thing I was able to find out during my research was pinpointing habitat references, at least in coastal South Carolina. Um, from what I can tell is that intricacators prefer the shaded understories of predominantly hardwood forests, generally mesic forests, wet forests. Um, they don't have to be wetlands, um, but um, they prefer to stay within the canopy of uh, moist soil forests. However, it appears that for the larvae, they prefer like emerald wetlands and wetland margins strongly. Um, especially floodplains. The further up upstate you get, the more concentrated the intricacators get into river valleys. Because down on the coast where I am, they just kind of show up everywhere. But, you know, our, our topography grade for a 300 acre property isn't that much. So it's, it, you know, one dip in the ground, one fall over tree tree is a wetland. You get up here in the upstate, you have 100, you know, 100 foot elevation changes. It concentrates them down in river valleys consistent wet soils. Um, I have not yet observed them in any dry savannas, um, disturbed areas like lawns or other manicured areas where there's a lot of disturbance of the vegetation. Um, any sunny area, I've not seen them in well drains, arid forests, or on hilltops, um, except for around permanent wetlands, not necessarily permanent water, but permanently wet, not a, a full lot of wetland. Um, and as well as Carolina Bays. You find in the margin of the curve, it's very really consistent on the coast. Um, and I've, I've seen the whole gamut here in the state. I mean, it was thought before that they were only on like the extreme coast, but like I said, just, just a couple weeks ago, Dave and I found one up um, on by Packerlet in uh, Spartanburg County. And then there's one that was reported real early on back in 96. Um, Where in 96 did you find it? I didn't find it, um, but it was. Uh, I think it was at the Heritage Preserve. The Heritage Preserve, the actual historic site? Historic site. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I've, I've, there's a population in Ventersville, Alabama, like 700 feet above the elevation that has consistently been reporting in containers for the last five or six years now. Um, so elevation doesn't seem to be the limiting factor. It seems to be more so the microsite conditions, um, the equipment. So thus far, here is the current range, or this is the current range map that I presented back in 2019, the last time I gave this talk. And as you can see, there's a lot of gaps. Um, and here's what it is as of this week. And I just added two records in the last week to this. Um, so we're starting to fill in the gaps, and we have a much better idea of what the distribution is. We're still shaky about North Carolina. I only have like one report from each one of these counties. And they all came in not very long ago. However, I am pretty confident this is a, an established population up here in uh, Virginia. I've seen three reports from that same county thus far. Um, and this Ohio one, I don't, know, I don't trust that too much, nor do I trust the Asheville one. But I had two records of a male from the dorsal surface that didn't show a dark patch. So I've got those marked just in case, but I want to see more records before I can remind her of those. But it appears to be there all the way through the Piedmont, um, all throughout the, the southeastern we don't know where they're going to get us in Virginia and North Carolina. There's just not been enough um, butterflies reported. Uh, and also, just this week, I made this live map now, which I have accessible here at this QR code. If not, you know, you see the link. Um, that I'm going to try and update live. So if you ever just want to see where the distribution map is, um, I will have this live right in the background for the rest of my life, probably. <laughs> Uh, so, just to get more into the habitat, um, 
River floodplains seem to be the real big thing. Um, again, like I said, down on the coast, uh, there's a lot more homogeneity as far as what the habitat goes. You could say it's just going to be crazy abundant. But as you move further and further up in the, or inland, more into the Piedmont, where you have greater changes in elevation, the populations get more and more concentrated down in the floodplains and river systems. Um, and I just don't spend enough time up, up here um, to really look into more isolated wetland systems to see what they're there. Um, but so far, consistently, from all of the, the citizen science reports that I've been seeing, they're always within like two to three hundred foot of the river anytime I get a report from the Down on the coast, they're Like I said, thin stamp understory, lush, lush grassy, grassy vegetation, as well as causeways running through wetland systems. They seem to really love, um, well, basically, if you think about that, the causeway is just one kind of wetland market. So they seem to be able to really colonize those systems well. So that's the most disturbed sites I've seen them in. Road edges on causeways running through, like floodplains and bottlenecks and coasts and that kind of stuff. Um, but again, it's they like a thin stamp underscore, a lot of lush grasses. They really like it to be shaded. They don't spend a lot of time on the full sun. They can run into Carolina stairs and like a lot of environments where they get out of the sun. Um, the intricates really just like to be in the darkness. Um, from what I've seen, where it's really hard to take photographs. Um, let's see. Uh, with Carolina stairs, um, they tend to be more generalists. I see them in practically every habitat that's got those plants that can support them. Um, I see them in a lot more drier sites and seem to have a much better tolerance of um, pine forest. I don't see intricate cedars in pure pine forest practically at all, other than like the coastal margins. That's the only exception. Um, it's not really pure pine forest at that point. Um, but Carolina cedars, I'll see them, you know, Roadsides and you know, pine plantations and that kind of stuff. I'll see them in lawns, I've got them in my yard. Um, they, they seem to be a lot more tolerant, a lot more systems. Seems like um, they're, they can just, they're able to adapt and cope with a little, much wider degree of micro site conditions than the intricate stairs, from what I can tell. However, it could be that the intricate stairs could use these habitats and Carolina stairs just preclude them. Um, so maybe the Carolina stairs out from the I don't know. It, it, to me, it seems like there's something in the practice that is excluding one or the other. Um, so just as an example, this is the exact kind of habitat I'm talking about down in Coast Plains, South Carolina, where I see intricate stairs consistently. You know, just a, a heavy understory with just dense grasses or sedges underneath it. You know, it's, where the mosquitoes are the worst, that's where the intricate <laughs> Additionally, behavior is another big thing. It just that reminded me of one thing I wanted to touch on here. The intricate cedar is undersampled chronically as far as citizen science goes because people don't think to look for them because they're such a new cryptic species. Um, so when people see something that looks like a Carolina cedar, they say, that's a Carolina cedar, I'm getting out of here. The mosquitoes are bad and it's really human. And so people aren't taking photos of intricate cedars because they get into a habitat like this Bugs are bad, the heat's bad, the humidity's bad. They don't bother taking photos of the satyrs. Um, so Carolina satyrs get more photographed because they occur in more disturbed sites, and lawns, and higher upland areas, and they just are kind of omnipresent on the landscape in the southeast. Because the intricate satyrs are more concentrated in these marginal weather habitats, so they focus on them. But behavior is another thing, key thing that I noted in my study. Um, the, the intricate satyr is, once you get the eye for it, they behave markedly different from the Carolina satyr. This is a big thing in allowing you to be able to prioritize your identification while you're getting exsanguinated in the swamp uh, by the mosquitoes, is intricate satyrs fly more slowly, they have deeper wings. To me, they feel more like a gem satyr or a Georgia satyr that's got some wear on it. They stick low to the ground, hover and hug vegetation, pick up and they move just a couple feet at a time unless they're really fresh. Um, and they're not like Carolina satyrs, which I'm sure we've all experienced trying to photograph them. They pick up 30 foot across 
you know, have to run the thing down every time you input it, it picks up and moves again. Um, what I've noticed is that intrapixators just sit there. They let you take photos of them. Whereas Carolina Sators can fight, work, run for them all across the landscape. Um, and so because of that, I've dubbed the term photogenicity for these things. Here's a, here's a photo, here's the photo I am taking here of the Sator while Allison is taking a photo of me taking a photo of it. I am six inches from this butterfly. And this, I do this a lot. In, See if this video loads. There it goes. Um, so this is a this is a video of me with my phone, no zoom, filming an intricate fixator at Roxbury Park, way back when I was in the middle of the study, after I realized there was a paper in there first. But you know, there's a butterfly just sitting there. And this far away from it with a phone camera. Oh my god. It's Try and do that with Carolina Sater. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I don't know what it is about it, but they are just so much more approachable, so much easier to photograph. Um, so when you do actually start knowing what to look for, and you start um, trying to identify <laughs> these things in the field, you can pick on, up on these small cues eventually, and like I said, it takes a holy amount of practice to finally get over the hump. Um, but, but once you know it, you can fairly easily start to pick out better candidates and then take a photo of them. Then you can work on that. So uh, my advice on that is just take as many photos as you can. And try and get a splat on the side of the machine and make yourself better. Uh, but that's the current set of scientific knowledge. That's, that's it. That's all we know about the species. These are the four papers that exist on them. Um, the only thing I really didn't get deep down into is the phylogenetics. There's still a lot that we just don't know about these butterflies. We don't, we have a very spotty county distribution. We don't know the whole sum total of states that they're found in. We're still, we're still debatable whether they're even found in Virginia or how far they go into the, the Piedmont and North Carolina. Um, we don't know whether or not there's any predictable differences in their phenology just because of the undersampling. Um, they, some areas they may consistently come out or later than other ones. Like I said, I've noticed consistently they're just far less prevalent in spring than Carolina stairs. Um, additionally, this is a big one. I don't think anyone really knows whether or not they're found outside in the United States. I know Allison said that she's seen a lot of things that look like intricate stairs in you know, uh, middle America. Um, and I've been sent, people keep tagging me down in South America and I just have to raise my hands and say, I don't know. Um, but. And they're potentially found all throughout South America and Middle America as well. Uh, I, I looked at photographs that seem to be intricate satyrs as well as photos that look clearly to be Carolina satyrs, but I just don't know uh, the full sum total from the Tichia out there and all the other various differences. Uh, additionally, ghost bands. I mean, it's, I just don't like thinking about those. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they weird me out. But I'll leave it at that. Um, <clears throat> however, you can help uh, advance our scientific knowledge of the species. Each and every one of y'all. Um, just go out there and just stand around in the swamp and get bit on mosquitoes and take one of those little bark brown butterflies. Um, and uh, probably, more than likely, if you go to one of the counties back on my map back there, uh, where there hasn't been one found and you go down in a river bottom and you start taking photos of cedars, you'll get a county record. I mean, there's just not <coughs> enough people doing it. Um, additionally, um, I, I sort of semi-officially curate um, Pomona, e-butterfly, and bug guide, all of the Hermia tichia observations from the capital U.S. that are submitted there, uh, and I unofficially curate my naturalist. So, uh, sounds like an actual job to get an actual curator position. Um, so if you upload a photo of a butterfly uh, to any one of these sites, I will see it eventually. Um, and additionally, if you just want me to tell you right now, you can just tag me on my naturalist or email me. I've got my email on the last slide. And uh, I also do help, uh, this is a thing I wanted to mention, I do help NAVA counts uh, with getting intricate staters on the list, but NAVA still does not recognize the intricate stater as a distinct species. I don't think they recognize the South Texas stater either. Um, so I've just been making sure that that stuff gets noted on the list so that whenever they do do that, hopefully, um, that, you know, that data is there and it's been collected and preserved. And uh, there's 
the literature cited. If any of y'all want to do some further reading on that. <laughs> and uh, that's it. Um, there's my email if anyone wants to get in touch with me. And uh, we'll for questions. I don't remember the specifics of your map, but do you have Texas data? Uh, sir, let me go back to Texas. Texas gets funny um, with the South Texas data, but like this is this is all I have, and I feel like I should have a lot more of that. Um, I know there's Carolina staters in this area, so I don't know. The range may just end here in East Texas. So now I'm where the butterflies stand. Okay. Um, why do you think there's such a concentration in southern or northern Florida? Uh, because that's where the research was done. That's where the research was done. <laughs> you see, uh, everything in here in green is what was there when I started my research. So as you can see, they did, you know, Warren, Warren is based out of University of Florida, so he did a lot of collecting down in South Florida. Okay. Your research is blue. Well, it's stuff I've either identified or stuff I have um, just siphoned off of all of these citizen science. Okay. Sites. okay. That's still your research. Yeah. It's stuff. Yeah. It's stuff I have added to the count, or at least I have coalesced from somebody else. We're going to count that your research. Sure. Get fine. I won't take credit. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I have the email. Mm -hmm. Pro. Uh, yeah, I have the, my, my Clemson alumni email is getting put through so I have to some of the Tom Austin discussion, as well as every other perturbation of my names. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you said that because everything I said you just cheated. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll send another mass email later. But, uh, I have uh, two small comments. I said thanks to man who got the Nobel Prize for the lead genome. And he was just didn't talk about a guy. He basically said, argued with me, what is a species? You know, and is there such a thing? Yeah. And you know, that, that underground is, is around because it depends a lot on where these animals are. And the second comment was, even when I was small, you know, the Nathanitals and the yeah. other species, oh, they just died out. Well, even when I was little, I'm thinking, you put a Nathanitals in a room with an homo zinc, they're going to mate eventually. You know, so. You're going to get a fist fight or start mating. <laughs> <laughs> Because there's an east-west 
super zone that runs right through there for a whole lot of different biota. And so a lot of eastern stuff meets western stuff right out there. So I'm betting that you've got a good chunk of Texas that you're going to get. Which is Travis County? I know we have a record. Like green thing. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I'm betting 